And good day. I am Tamira Scott. Thank you for joining us as we bring you truth for our time. Always give you news that you can use, oftentimes that you don't get anywhere else, especially the mainstream media. Um, Much happening right now. You know that the Supreme Court heard a case on marriage yesterday, and this might surprise you. I don't think they should have. I think that the Supreme Authority has already defined it. The Supreme Court doesn't get that chance. So that might surprise you that I feel that way, but I, I, I don't think that they get the opportunity to override what's already been done, what has been history, centuries, proven, healthy for civilizations. So I just um, I don't think that this is their area. And I'm not sure which, which founding father, uh, I think it was Hamilton, and I, uh, I'm trying to remember which, was it 78, one of the papers, 70, Federalist Papers? Um, he may have even been an anti-Federalist, I'm not sure, but I think it was 78 or 79, where he said if it's going to affect the body political, then it goes through the legislative process. It doesn't go through the courts. If it's individual and a remedy, then it goes through the courts. And I just think our courts are overstepping their bounds. And frankly, I appreciate what New Gingrich said years ago is that when the courts overstep their bounds, then then the legislature has to set their boundaries again, uh, reset or reaffirm the boundaries. And I think we're missing that right now. So obviously today, if you're guessing, we're going to be talking about the Supreme Court. We're also going to be talking with some individuals from North Carolina. After Indiana passed a religious liberty bill and then came back and gutted it, you would think that some people would stay away or states would stay away from the topic. We're pleased that North Carolina is not and other states are not as well. So we'll be talking with uh, Tammy Fitzgerald, who is uh, out of Carolina and with the Values Coalition and also with um, Austin. Let me get my glasses on here. Austin Nimix with the um, Alliance Defending Freedom uh, a group, which is we've had attorneys on from that group many, many times throughout the past. They're great at defending our liberties and oftentimes our religious liberties. Um, so we'll be talking with them shortly. Uh, first, I want to talk to, is is Deb on the phone? Deb Bowen's on the phone. Excellent. Good morning, Deb. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm good. This is a surprise for our guests and our listeners. I just called Deb just moments ago, but here's why. You, Deb was a guest on our show a couple of weeks ago, and she talked about the book by me. The book by me is a series of books written about Holocaust survivors. While we still have them, as you know, their ages, we're losing them, we're losing many of them daily, along with our World War II veterans here in America. But what these books do, Deb masterfully, I just think this was a divine idea, Deb. She lined up these survivors with students, elementary through uh, high school students, and had them tell their story to the student who then wrote it and illustrated it. I'm opening a book now for those of you who are watching live on webcast1live.com, webcast1live.com. You can see the illustration is by the child. The book is by the child. I love this for a couple reasons. As I've said before, it one, it's teaching multi-generations because you have parents involved, but you have the children writing, and people are less likely to criticize when a child writes. They're more likely to read it without that um, bias right away uh, as that they might give an adult. So I love what you have accomplished in doing this, Deb. Well, thank you. I love it as well. Each child adds something a little bit different, and um, the end result is just incredible in my eyes. I think it's beautiful. It's a tribute. It's honoring. So thank you. Thank you for popping on today. I wanted to add you in the discussion because our friends from North Carolina are going to be talking about a bill on religious liberty. You are talking about Holocaust survivors who were persecuted and suffered the worst, many of them killed um, in in the Nazi camps, the prison camps, the death camps. So you can you can bring out that idea of religious liberty, but you have one very special survivor right in North Carolina. Who is it? I do. Her name is Frida Ruse, and uh, she was a, she's a survivor from the Netherlands. Um, she survived, but her parents did not. Uh, her family did not, except for one uncle. And uh, she was a singer. Uh, she sang on uh, the radio. She sang Snow White specifically was her specialty. And uh, right up until the day the Nazis invaded, and then, of course, she was no longer worthy uh, to be an entertainer in the Netherlands because of her uh, Judaism. 
So she was forced into hiding, and um, just miracle after miracle, uh, she survived the war uh, with a girlfriend, and um, then later immigrated to Canada, where she did have an uncle, and he asked her to convert to Christianity out of fear, I think mostly was his reasoning. Um, but today she remembers her Judaism fondly. She practices Christianity. But she met with a young boy named Daniel Gittleman, and he told her story, and she turned 100 years old last Friday. That is tremendous. I know. She's a centurion. And it's so exciting because all she really wants for her birthday, she has no need. She wants his book distributed to public libraries and schools throughout North Carolina. So So, help us do that. You have a GoFundMe set up. Where where can people find that? uh, GoFundMe uh, backslash Frida, um, and you can search it that way. And, uh, yeah, we're just, any any amount will help us out. Uh, We just need to... Um, to get the money collected and the books are ready to go to print and put in the schools. And she couldn't be happier. We did an advanced printing and, and put a few books in schools so she knows already children are studying her story this this spring. So that's exciting, um, but we just want to complete the job and get them in the public libraries too so that kids can check them out and maybe be inspired to go find others from North Carolina who live through this period of time. It's it's the last chance that we have to interview them and tell their stories. And to hear it truthfully from the lips of those who lived it. Absolutely. And so, Frida, what is her last name? Ruse, R-O-O-S. And I know my guest coming on the show shortly would like to make contact with her. Can I help somehow between you and them make that happen off air? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Deb, thank you so much for joining us, for popping on at late notice. I appreciate you just sharing this information with us. Frida Roos is the woman we're talking about, a 100-year-old centurion who survived the death, the Nazi death camps and and, 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 um, the uh, internment camps. So we just thank you for bringing her and her story to us, Deb Bowen. If people want more... She is amazing. She's amazing. And on a good day, she can still sing Snow White. (laughs) Really? Yeah, she sang it for me two years ago. It was wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, Thanks. Deb Bowen. If you want more information about Deb, you can go to a book by me, and it's .com, right, Deb? Correct. A book by me .com. A great idea. If you have survivors you know of, um, even maybe perhaps a, a World War II veteran with a great story, I Absolutely. think you need to contact Deb. So a book by me is the best way to do that. Deb Bowen, thank you for joining me. Terrific. Thank you. All right. Um, Ryan, thank you so much for organizing and popping things on without much notice, my faithful producer. Uh, So we have on the line with us our friends from North Carolina, and I need to thank Cammie Mueller for helping make this happen. Cammie Mueller uh, is the uh, the founder and, and principal of Honey and Still. You can find her on Etsy, by the way, just a little shout out for her there, but appreciate her work that she's doing with this. Tammy Fitzgerald is the North Carolina Values Coalition. She's a chairwoman for Vote for Marriage North Carolina, an official referendum committee that successfully passed the North Carolina Marriage Amendment. She's a lobbyist in the General Assembly for six to seven years on pro-family, pro-business issues. She's an attorney in North Carolina, Arizona, and Oklahoma for over 20 years, 22 years, uh, former executive director of North Carolina for Marriage, NC for Marriage, and former board member of Pro Family Group in North Carolina Classical Christian in Classical Christian School. So my thanks for her for joining us. Also, Austin Nimix will be joining us. So let's say hello to Tammy first. Good morning, Tamara. Thank you for having me on your show today. Thank you for taking time out to talk to us. This is the hot topic right now. Well, absolutely. I mean, we've seen a spate of lawsuits across the country that have threatened the ability of people who have deeply held religious beliefs to live out their faith in their lives and their everyday work. And um, so, you know, the idea of religious freedom is not a new idea to our country. In fact, I believe that's why the pilgrims came to Plymouth Rock. And yet, um, all of a sudden, this is this is such a controversial issue that states like Indiana um, and Arkansas have seen a lot of protests against just allowing people to live and work uh, according to their beliefs. And um, so we are attempting to uh, pass a law similar to the ones that Arkansas and Indiana considered here in North Carolina. And we're hoping that um, our legislators here will do the right thing 
and actually bring this law up for consideration. Okay, so I'm going to also now bring Austin Nimix into the conversation. He's an attorney with Alliance Defense Fund in Washington, D.C. He's with the Regional Service Center. He litigates and as a member of uh, the Marriage Litigation Center. Um, he joined ADF in 2007, and is, he's focused much of his professional efforts on cases involving same-sex marriage and divorce, parental rights, voters' rights, and other matters relating to religious freedom and liberty. So his extensive trial and appeal at court record includes involvement in several religious liberty and family values cases across the nation. And he's authored several pieces of pro-family legislation and politi- uh, policy memorandums. So, um, and he's testified before various legislative bodies in different states. So we're very pleased to have him joining us as well. Austin, thank you for, for joining the conversation. Well, thank you for having me on. It's my pleasure. So uh, we'll just kind of take this as if we were having coffee at one of the local um, uh, coffee shops. And uh, with the three of us, I I think we'll be fine just entering in the conversation. I don't think that will be an issue at all. If there's something that one of you feel like you best handle, feel free to defer to the other one. And if I fail to bring up a very important topic on this issue, please do so. Don't wait for me to lead. This is such a vast issue right now. I'm going to start off by just saying, We never thought this would happen in America. We've so enjoyed such liberty and such freedom for so long that now generations um, have taken it for granted. And we watched it be chipped away and peeled away without our response. Now that it's not just that we are um, having to stand strong, but we're having to retake the mountain. We're having to retake what was ours. And... As I said, we never thought it would happen in America. Um, Tammy or Austin, I don't know if you want to comment on these situations, but I just read yesterday, Idaho, a city in Idaho, is threatening pastors that if they don't do a same-sex marriage ceremony, they will be threatened, they are threatened with jail time, and what I hear is a very expensive fine. Are either of you familiar with this case? Yeah, we really are, and... uh... It's really unfortunate to see things like this develop. For so long in our country's history, we've respected people's freedom of religion. We've respected their freedom of conscience, uh, not forcing people to do things that they don't believe in. I mean, that's kind of the essence of of the American experience, this idea of pluralism and the melting pot and and having tolerance for others that we may not agree with them, uh, but we do tolerate each other's beliefs in a free society. And the willingness of some now to to use the force of law to try to coerce others into agreeing with them. And this, this type of thought police mentality is really disturbing. It just highlights why we need uh, to protect religious freedom in all areas of law. You bring up Idaho. When people look at Idaho politically as, as a red state, uh, a conservative state, uh, a can say, the state that, that cherishes uh, family values, how could this happen in a place like Idaho? Uh, and people a lot of times think it can't happen here. It can't happen in my backyard. But yet we see these types of things happening all over the place. We saw it happen in North Carolina, uh, where the state was trying to coerce magistrates into performing same-sex marriages here, right, right, right in North Carolina. So it, it is happening all over, and people need to wake up and re-engage in this advanced citizenry uh, we call America, where the people matter and they have to lend their voices. And before Idaho, it was Houston an activist mayor uh, telling pastors that they would be jailed. And I think there was even a comment that she said something about she didn't even think they deserved a trial, which is just most alarming to me. And so um, let's come back. The cake baker out west, uh, what was the fine? Was it 130 some thousand dollars 135000 uh, dollars This administrative judge levied against a Christian couple that owns a bakery in the state of Oregon. And you know what he levied the fine for? Emotional damages. Uh, Emotional damages that were supposedly inflicted upon a same-sex couple who had to go to another bakery in order to get a cake to celebrate their same-sex wedding. I mean, they were able to get a cake. Uh, That's not an issue. They had to make one more phone call or one more email or whatever the case was in order to get what they wanted. They got what they wanted. Uh, and then they sued this Christian couple, uh, and this judge said that the emotional damages to this couple amounts to $135,000, and that doesn't even include 
what this judge may add in terms of fines, penalties, and attorney's fees. Uh, it's absolutely staggering to see something like that happen uh, in America, but yet we see it happening. We see it happening in Washington State to the florist we represent, Baron L. Stutzman, who wouldn't do floral design for a same-sex wedding. Uh, we see it happening in Colorado to a baker in Colorado. We see it happening in the state of Kentucky to a T-shirt printer who wouldn't print T-shirts for a gay pride parade. In all these cases, the same-sex couple and the gay rights advocates got everything they needed, uh, but then are demonstrating a remarkable amount of intolerance for people who don't agree with them by using the law to go after them. Um, people really need to wake up and wrap their minds around the threat uh, that is happening to all of us. And, and oddly enough, when I just posted on Facebook that I would be interviewing uh, the both of you on North Carolina's Right to Religious Freedom Act, you know how Facebook will post similar topics below. They posted something about gays and evangelicals, and the polls might surprise you. You see, my point is that they automatically go right to the same-sex marriage issue, to the homosexual issue. A religious liberty was never under attack in America until this particular issue. Why do you think that is? Well, it, it, it's, it's staggering that they would say something like that, because there have been a lot of historic attacks on religious liberty throughout our country's history. But yet we've always found a way to respect people's religious beliefs. Uh, I remember back when we used to have the draft, and military service was not optional. Uh and yet we still made a way for pacifists and those who didn't believe in war and didn't want to carry a gun uh, to participate in the military but not have to do something that violated their conscience. So even in questions of national security, uh, we've been willing to find a way uh, to accommodate people's religious beliefs. That's America. That's the heart of America. And the biggest difference now is there's no willingness to accommodate religious beliefs. It's this my way or the highway mentality. Uh, that is massively, massively disturbing to see. Uh, instead of a live and let live mentality, it's right. only live my way or die mentality. Right. And we see that with these lawsuits, $135,000 for emotional distress because you don't agree with somebody else based on your religious beliefs. That just can't be happening in the United States of America. And here's what I'm concerned about. that You're saying that's a judge that leveled that, but in some cases I believe it's a Civil Rights Commission, that, commission that's leveling these fines. Is that the case? Or does it that, is that's the case. The, that is <laughs> yeah, that's the case in Oregon. Absolutely, it was an administrative judge, so uh, it, it's somebody who's managing this this agency uh, of the state of Oregon. You're right. So my concern is in America. I thought we had a due process. You at least got to go to trial. You got you maybe perhaps by your peers, and I don't see that happening in these cases. I just see what I would call a witch hunt for someone who ha- may have a religious belief. That is an easy target right now. Well, absolutely. They are targeting people of faith because they want to stamp out um, the ability of people to disagree. And um, that's why we need religious freedom laws like the one that we're proposing in North Carolina, because um, people of faith are being targeted. Um, It's not just that they're being uh, incidentally affected. They're actually being sought out. And... um, so the bill that's coming up today uh, in our legislature here in North Carolina is is no new test. It's the same test that's been used for 23 years. It's the same test that the U.S. Supreme Court has adopted to deal with all First Amendment claims, including free speech and freedom of assembly. And uh, until until uh, 1990, you know, it was the test that the U.S. Supreme Court applied to burdens on religious exercise. And in that year, the U.S. Supreme Court lowered the standard for allowing the government to burden a free exercise of religion. And and very shortly thereafter, Congress passed almost unanimously what's known as the um, federal uh, RIFRA. And the federal RIFRA just reestablishes the test that the court had used previous to this case in 1990. Um, throughout the country, and we've got 27 states that now apply that test that have either adopted it through court decisions or through statute. And um, so what, you know, what we're trying to accomplish in North Carolina is not a new thing. It's just the same legal standard that all first-year law students learn in law school is applying to First Amendment burdens on your freedom. Okay. And RIFRA. 
for those listening, they they hear a word R F R A is what you're saying, and give our listeners the um, breakdown. It's Religious Freedom Restoration Act, correct? That is correct. Yes, that's what it's called. All right, and you're saying 27 other states already have this in law. Yes, they either apply it because the courts have adopted it, or because the the legislatures have adopted it through statute. So it's just a legal test that courts use in applying First Amendment freedoms to particular situations. And um, it's not an unusual standard. It's a, in fact, all lawyers recognize this standard. It just says that in order to burden your freedom of religion or your free speech, by the way, that the government has to show it has a compelling state interest and there's no other way to accomplish that other than this law that somehow burdens your religious exercise. Okay, we're going to have to take a break here because I do want to honor my sponsors. I so appreciate their help in making us, uh, p- making it possible for us to be on the air. Uh, Christians, uh, um, Christians for America, ChristiansforAmerica.com, Crave Revivals, uh, Citizens Reviving American Values Every Day. We appreciate the work that they do. We also appreciate world, uh, WebcastOneLive.com. Webcast One is spelled out, Live.com. Anytime you want to hear the show, 10 a.m. on Wednesdays, Central Time, you can join us View it, listen to it uh, live at that time, and you can even call in. Uh, I haven't given out that number, I guess, today, 515-244-0077, if you'd like to join the conversation. And so we thank also Mac and Max World, J. J. Michael McCoy, and my producer, Ryan, Ryan uh, um, for making everything possible for us here in the studio. We're going to go to a break, give those other sponsors some time, and we'll be right back. When we come back, I want to briefly talk, not... Um, I always get micro and macro confused, but not into the nitty gritty of the Indiana law, but as an overarching umbrella, what did the, what what was the harm if they were passing the same law that other states have already passed? So we'll talk about that briefly when we come back, and also some more issues here in Iowa as well. This is a a issue that's hitting right here in the state where we sit right now in the studio. We'll be right back after these messages. Stay tuned and. Call. <laughs> From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Homs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us, 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about, is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. (laughs) We have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. 
We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're gonna make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. And I am Tamara Scott. Thank you for staying tuned with us as we give you truth for our time. Here's the deal. If God expects you to live through it, he's directed you how to do it somewhere in his word. Someone sent me the verse of the day today and how appropriate. It's Amos 5, 15, hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. How fitting for today, right? Hate evil. Love good, maintain justice in the courts, Amos 515. And of course, I appreciate, as I said earlier, Newt Gingrich's idea that if the courts aren't going to maintain justice, then we don't maintain those justices. We'll find justices who will maintain uh, what we consider justice in a constitutional way here in America. I am talking with Tammy Fitzgerald and Austin Nimix. And Austin, am I saying your last name correctly? Yes, you are. Okay, good. I wanted to make sure. And you are both out of North Carolina right now. We're talking about the RIFRA, the um, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, I just want to touch briefly on Indiana. The fear in Indiana, this media storm hit that all of a sudden Indiana businesses were going to discriminate against people based on what we call SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity, or LGBTQ rights. When you're saying 27 other states already have these bills, these laws, we haven't seen that. I have not ever seen in my, maybe I'm limited, maybe I, I, I'm just unaware, but I have not seen someone in the media sought out because of their sexual orientation or LGBTQ practicing lifestyle, but I have seen several sought out because of their Christian beliefs. Well, and it's... Exactly. That's the whole point here. The RIFRA is not about discriminating against anyone. It's about protecting people from discrimination. It's about protecting people who have sincerely held religious beliefs from being discriminated against by the law and uh, by government overreach. Um, You know, it's interesting. You mentioned the business aspect of this. Um, You know, the research shows that Several of the best states for business have referred. In fact, in America's top states for business rankings for 2014, which is compiled by CNBC, seven of the top 20 states have a RIFRA. And other studies have shown that 10 of the top 20 economically healthy states have RIFRAs. And so this idea that somehow uh, RIFRA is going to hurt business or that it's going to be used by business to discriminate against other people is just simply wrong. And I don't know how um, people are actually stating these things as if they were fact, but it's getting out there in the news by uh, people who oppose religious freedom that uh, somehow business is going to use this to discriminate or that it's going to hurt business. Why is it? Uh, help me explain to our listeners and our viewers. It's It's not... I, I said in the post that I send out to several, this isn't just about those who have a deeply held religious conviction. If you're an atheist, if you're an agnostic, you also need to stand up for these laws because they protect the First Amendment. If you can come after religion, you lose all right to associate. Am I correct in that? Yeah, you, you really are. You you really are, as far as that's concerned. You know, if you want to understand Ripper in one word, it's tolerance. RIFRA is about tolerance, and this is not a controversial law. I think your listeners need to understand that. I mean, as Tammy mentioned earlier, it was passed by a nearly unanimous Congress, signed into law by President Clinton in 1993. It was supported by groups on the left and the right, including the ACLU. Everybody came together, all walks of life and corners of society, for this law because it promoted tolerance. So why now are people opposing it? And the reason that people are opposing is because they're intolerant of people with religious beliefs. That's, That's the exactly difference. right. And, and people, the, the issue here is ahead, whether Tim. tolerance is a two-way street. Right. Right. Austin, go ahead and, 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 and uh, finish, too, if you, if you wanted to add more to that. Well, I, I just, I just, if people want to understand the difference between what happened 22 years ago when federal RIFR became the first RIFR in the country, 
Uh, in the last 20 years, when states, uh, uh, 21 states have enacted it legislatively and seven more through the courts, as Tammy mentioned, the people who are opposing this are intolerant of people with religious beliefs. They don't have the ability to live and let live. And it's really unfortunate to see that type of opposition come out. And, and let me make an additional point just to be clear. You know, not everybody that some of the groups who are opposing these laws uh, purports to represent opposed reference. Um, we represent a florist in Washington State. Your listeners may be familiar with this case uh, who served the same-sex couple for nine years, but when they wanted her to design floral art for their wedding, she was unable to do it, and she referred them to another florist who took care of them, no problem. After she was sued, it was really encouraging to see so many members of the gay and lesbian community come out in support of our Washington florist to say what is happening to her is unfair. We don't agree with her beliefs, but we are willing to be tolerant of her beliefs, and she should not be sued because she has religious beliefs. Now, that's a display of American tolerance, and that's what we need more of, and that's what this bill is about. We're not always going to agree. That's the American experience. We don't live in communist Russia. <laughs> we live in a place where we have opinions all over the place, but are we willing to show respect and tolerate different viewpoints that's what RIFRA is all about, and there's really no reason why everybody shouldn't support this type of bill. And so because it usually comes up or often comes up concerning a, a homosexual marriage ceremony, uh, LGBTQ rights, um, what do you say when people ask, aren't you targeting the LGBTQ community? Well, I would say simply that RIFRA is not exclusively about the LGBT community. RIFRA has 22 years of existence where we can look at the history of this law and realize this is so much bigger than any contemporary dispute. Uh, RIFRA has managed cases between prisoners uh, and the government and all kinds of different religious beliefs with regard to Amish and other religious minorities. It's a big law that makes sure we have big amounts of tolerance for a wide and diverse range of beliefs. And to say that it's about one specific thing, really does a massive disservice to the type of tolerance and diversity and pluralism that RIFRA is designed to celebrate. And so it's not just one about these little things, and it doesn't target anybody. It provides a balancing test so we can weigh the interest in any given case. It doesn't pick winners or losers. It's, it's, it's to make sure that we can all come together and find our way through any difficult situation. Tammy, you have anything to add on that? To me, it looks like RIFRA just simply gives everybody their fair day in court. We're, we're, That's exactly what it does. It is, as Austin said, it doesn't determine the outcome of the case. It just allows the courts to balance the rights of the individual to practice their beliefs against the um, the compelling interests of the state government. So it, it, it acknowledges that sometimes government does have a higher interest uh, than, than a person's ability to practice their beliefs. And so, but it places a high burden on government to prove that the interest really should overcome the right of the individual to practice their beliefs. So the bill is about protecting the fundamental freedom upon which our country was founded, the first freedom found in our Bill of Rights, which is the freedom to exercise your religious beliefs. And this also, it, it, it gives a burden of proof for those who are, are using religious freedom and deeply held religious convictions as a defense. It gives them a burden of proof as well. So I think it is a balancing tool for Well they yes, they must show that it's a sincerely held religious belief. And honestly the courts have been very adept at discerning what are sincerely held religious beliefs and what are, you know, spook. And uh, the courts are fully able to determine that, even though it's not up to the courts to determine whether someone's religious views are valid or not. Um, but but it has proven historically to be a very workable test that the courts have been able to apply in many cases. Um, and we've had 146 cases decided under some sort of referent, whether at the state or federal level, and it's never been used to allow discrimination. Let me ask you this. People often bring in right away 
uh, African Americans at the lunch counter being refused service, Jim Crow laws. In fact, we had a legislator in the House in Iowa just recently. I wish I could remember the date so anyone listening could look it up on the archives. But Representative Stephen Holt gave a great personal point of privilege on simply needing to protect the religious values of business owners in Iowa. We have several here who have been under attack, having to pay fines, and uh, no longer, in fact, the Gortz House, a lovely Mennonite couple, took a church building that was going to be condemned and destroyed in a small community, rebuilt this beautiful architectural structure. It is now a, a bistro cafe, Art gallery, uh, jewelry is sold there, home furnishings. It is just a lovely spot for the community to gather. And this owner had done business with homosexuals over the years. She'd had employed homosexuals as cooks. Certainly no animosity on her part in history or otherwise in witness. And one of her customers, who she often does floral arrangements for and would continue to do floral arrangements for, asks that they hold the marriage ceremony itself in her place of business. She simply said no, she could not do that being a Mennonite. Here's the predicament. Maybe you can answer this as attorneys. If she would have said yes, her employees, many are Mennonite, how can she say to them, you have to do something that goes against your your religious belief, she likely would have been sued, possibly, I don't know if Mennonites sue, but the point being, it was she would have impeded on her religious rights of her employees, and since she simply declined, she did not deny anyone their rights, she simply declined that particular portion of the service, would have helped out with reception, would have helped out with flowers, but could not do the wedding holy ceremony itself. She has been taken to the the Commission on Civil Rights. They were fined a big amount of money. Beckett Fund helped defend them, and they've been told now, listen to this. Oh, Gortz, uh, thank you, Ryan. He's put it up on the screen, the Gortz House, to stop all weddings in the wake of a discrimination complaint. They can no longer do wedding flowers or any business reception otherwise along with a wedding. That was a large percentage of their business. We'll be lucky if they stay in business. They have they, Their livelihood has been destroyed. It really, it really has, and uh, you see sometimes how failing to balance interests, which RIFRA does, uh, can result in just a massively unfair ruling and discrimination against Christian and Mennonite beliefs in this particular instance. Keep in mind that the same-sex couple at the heart of that case didn't have any problems no. finding a venue to celebrate uh, celebrate their, their ceremony. So. What, who really lost here? It, it's not just this Mennonite couple, but it's all Iowans. It, it, it's all tolerance for all religious beliefs generally. Um, and live and let live means sometimes we're going to conflict, sometimes we're not going to disagree, or we're not going to agree, but we find ways for everybody to get what they want and keep moving forward. That's not the result of this case. And the intolerance demonstrated to this Mennonite couple is is really, really unfortunate. Absolutely, and it's not the first case here in Iowa. But I, I kind of got off on that, and forgive me, but I w- wanted to bring that example in, and that's why Representative Stephen Holt was talking about it. The unfortunate thing here is that a, a blustery, uh, well, I'll curb my tongue, Representative Bruce Hunter then came up against him, opposed him, and there was another female Democratic legislator, and I don't remember her name, so I won't say, but it would be on the archives if you all want to go back and search at some point for our listeners. But Bruce Hunter brought up, and the female did as well, African-American female Democratic Party, I can't think of her name, um, brought up the African-American's plight in America and the horrible uh, 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 act of slavery and unfortunately, we didn't come back and combat that in the in the House with the fact that Christianity is a large part what did away with slavery in this country. But my point to you is they bring back Jim Crow laws. What is your defense on that? Well, this is this is one of the interesting parts of this discussion because a lot of people try to do that to compare it to the Jim Crow laws. And yet the Civil Rights Movement was based on the fact that there was widespread discrimination against Black Americans uh, solely on the basis of their race and that they couldn't receive essential services anywhere. And um, so we passed laws to protect them on the basis of their race. Now, what you have going on here is that you you have a class um, um, of people based on sexual orientation who are claiming 
uh, that they should receive the same type of non-discrimination rights when there's been no proof at all, and there is no proof that exists that would say that they've been widely discriminated against or that they cannot receive essential goods and services. And Austin pointed out a very essential point that in most of these cases um, where a business owner is asked to provide a service that violates or participate in a ceremony that violates their deeply held religious beliefs, they are referring these customers to other businesses who will supply the service. And so um, there's been no denial of essential services. There is a, a lot of uh, there are a lot of businesses out there who want to serve gay couples, and so um, there just isn't the same type of argument that would substantiate some sort of protected class or some sort of imposition of of government um, burden on religious beliefs. So you cannot compare this to the case of racial discrimination uh, that we've that we've been through the country. It's just not the same situation. What we're seeing is that people, and I think when the president says something about your, your religious expression, being able to express your religion on church on Sunday morning is not what the founding fathers intended. Um, and when I speak about this, it lights up the, the hate mail. <laughs> and I've often said if Christians <laughs> were as good at loving as the other side is at good at, as good at hating, we would have great strides being made. But, um, the, the, the idea that we have religious liberty isn't just for a two-hour service on a Sunday morning or a Saturday evening. It, our founding fathers talked about it in their writings. It is evident in many of their beliefs that this nation was built on Judeo-Christian values. And so when well, exactly. And the Supreme Court has said that um, religious exercise means just that. It means exercising your religious beliefs, not just holding those beliefs. Um, what we see increasingly from the Obama administration and other uh, people who want to curb religious freedom is that they want to talk about um, worship, which they define as worshiping in the four walls of your church or the four walls of your home. And yet, and yet what they're advocating for is that Christians and people of other faiths are not allowed to, to actually practice and live out those beliefs outside the four walls of their home or their church. Which we're we're now seeing cases where a female may want to wear her head covering in her photo for an ID. You know, I have an issue with that. At some point, you may have to make a decision whether you want that ID or not. But but it seems we're making all kinds of accommodations for every faith except Christianity. It certainly seems to be the target, the arrow for everyone's uh, dis dislike and attack. We really are, uh, as a country, and Tammy's exactly right about the whole worship versus exercise thing. Remember that the First Amendment protects the free exercise of religion, and religion is a big term. Uh, we all operate uh, our, our daily lives, those of us who are religious, by a certain religious beliefs, and we see that out in society when we see people who, who wear head coverings or, or Jews that we know that wear yarmulkes. Uh, there is an exercise of your religion that goes beyond the four walls of your church, and our Founding Fathers chose those words, free exercise of religion. It's a big and it's a broad concept, and, you know, it, it's really disheartening uh, to listen to advocates on the other side bring up a Jim Crow type of arguments and completely discard history and forget that the type of uh, mainline Orthodox religious beliefs that RIFRAs would be designed to protect in America are the same mainline Orthodox religions and denominations that were the leaders of and at the forefront of the civil rights movement in this country. Uh, people like to discard the fact that Christianity was at the forefront uh, of leading the struggle in civil rights uh, for African Americans in this country, and to suggest that all of a sudden there's been some 180-degree turn in how how Christians view the idea of civil rights is absolutely ridiculous. Christians are the ones that are have led the civil rights movement, not just historically in this country, but around the world, as we continue to see, uh, as we know, atrocities uh, well outside of America uh, on so many others uh, for whom people have intolerance. So I so appreciate just having the discussion with you, but I know we want, probably want to give maybe phone numbers out for the Carolina legislator. Is, are there people you're wanting them to call? What do people need to be doing to support your state in this? Well, thank you for asking. Um, 
one of the most important things they can do is go to the website petition that we've set up for people to sign who are supporting RIFRA. It's called livefaithfullync.com. People can go to that site and uh, sign the petition, and it will contact legislators and the governor here automatically. Um, another site that we are familiar with is called NCBiz, B-I-Z, the number four, RIFRA. If people go to that site, um, that's where a business owner can sign up as saying they support the RIFRA, and that will send a notification to legislators and the governor as well. So two sites there, NCBiz or RIFRA, dot com or live faithfully nc dot com. All right. Thank you for giving us both of those. Folks, tweet those out. Let's make some hashtags. Let's tweet those out and uh, let's stir it up a little bit on your Facebooks, your social media. But also, when we come back, we're going to go to a break again and thank our sponsors. When we come back, I want to run through some of these polls we're seeing here in North Carolina. Um, do you agree that there should be a law in North Carolina that requires the government to prove in court that it's absolutely necessary to violate a citizen's rights, religious freedoms, before it violates that freedom? I, I can't imagine that there's you know, anything other than absolute yes on this, but it's frightening to me how much people are no longer understanding the process here in America, the due process, the, the idea of privacy without uh, you know, a search and seizure warrant, all of that. But we'll come back and talk about that. And I also maybe want to touch on the Supreme Court hearing about marriage yesterday and any thoughts that you may have on that. And also we'll talk about the, um, the conservative steering committee of the religion, the Republican party and what they're doing supporting marriage. Did you know their 1856 platform talked about marriage being a stability in a good society? So we'll come back and talk very quickly about those. Stay tuned right after these break, right after these messages, we'll be right back. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can give these grandkids back, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We can help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hey, psst. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places. Especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. I'm holding up the 2014 edition from Liberty Institute. For those of you who are looking online, webcastonelive.com, each Wednesday, 10 a.m., if you want to join us for the live show. Undeniable, Undeniable is the name of the book, A Survey of of Hostility to Religion in America. Undeniable. It's about an inch, inch and a half thick. This is up to 2014. The case is simply on religious liberty. Christianity is is under attack in America today. And whether you're agnostic, atheist, understand that if they come against that First Amendment right, you lose many other rights. Your right to assemble, your right to associate, your right to expression of thought. Um, It is a a dangerous downhill, slippery, slippery slope. And so don't be taken back by the term Christianity and that this is a pro-Christian bill. Understand that um, 
this if you lose this freedom of religion, you lose so many other rights in America. And and that's been the beauty of this country, as Austin and Tammy have said, is that we may not always agree, but we will fight to the death for others' right to say what they believe. That's what's made us so strong as a country. Tammy Fitzgerald is my guest. Austin Nimix is my guest. Austin is with um, the Alliance Defending Freedom Fund, and Tammy is an attorney with the um, is it Values Coalition. Tammy? Did I lose? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Value, oh, sorry. Values it's Coalition. North Carolina Values Coalition. Thank you so much. And so um, just quickly, President Obama, when he was yet a senator, signed a couple of, or passed, voted to pass a couple of RIFRA bills. Is that correct? He did. In the uh, in the Illinois Senate, he voted twice to pass RIFRA. Um, you know, the federal RIFRA was a bipartisan measure, almost unanimous support. I think it passed unanimously in the House of Representatives, and there were only three members in the Senate who voted against it. The primary sponsor was Senator Chuck Schumer. It was voted for by people like Nancy Pelosi. It's just not a controversial measure. And the North Carolina Religious Freedom Restoration Act is virtually the same as that federal RIFRA that passed with hardly any opposition 22 years ago. So um, the fact that people are now making it into the monster they want to make it into um, is just bewildering because it has it has never been used in the way that claimed it could be used or would be used. And uh, there just is no evidence that um, would support any of those claims. It shows that um, when we have a plumb line, a measuring tool, the, the line has not been moved. What has been changed is the attitude in America, and that is further alarm is, and, I think, reason as to why we need laws like this. I applaud those of you in North Carolina, your legislators. You say your governor will sign it? We're not sure. Um, we're hoping that he will. He has made some statements that, you know, are, are sort of uh, unclear, and so uh, we're hoping that he'll support a law that 90% of the people in North Carolina support. You know, there was a recent poll released last week by Clout Research that asked the question, did you agree or disagree that citizens of North Carolina should have the right to exercise their own personal freedom of religion? And the answer to that question was that 90.1% of people in the state agree with that question. So it it is overwhelmingly supported by the people of North Carolina. And, um, you know, this is just in keeping with what we already knew, that people value religious freedom. It's a basic human right. It's a basic American value. And there's no reason not to protect it with a law. And for those political parties out there who are always looking to get groups, I, I don't like it when they put us into groups and pit us against each other, but, you know, whether it's the black vote, the African-American, if that's what you want to, to term it as, or the female vote, the single female, the age, they break them down all kinds of ways. But the one thing we see, and I don't know, you may have the figures better than I, um, a large number, I think it was 34,000 pastors said they were leaving their denomination, black pastors were leaving their denomination in support of marriage because their denomination was no longer supporting marriage. So this is an issue, as you're saying, at 90% approval, people want the right to believe as they find appropriate. And so I have one more question on this, this cloud research, which is excellent. If someone wants to see these poll numbers, can you give those out? Would you give those out? Can they go to cloud research and get them? I believe the poll numbers are up on our website on livefaithfullync.com. So I think you can have access to the poll there. Uh, But yes, absolutely. If someone wants to email us, we're happy to send them a link to the poll um, or to send them a PDF of the poll. And they can reach us at info at ncvalues.org. Info at NC, like North Carolina. Mm-hmm. values dot org dot org org okay now the one poll number on here that kind of alarmed me as i said was the number that citizens who believe you should have to have a court case to, vo- to prove that uh, it necessary to vitally violate a citizen's religious freedom before it does violate that freedom i would like to have seen higher numbers in that one strongly agree we're only 46 percent we've so failed to teach our students in school the First Amendment, the ten, the first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights, 
What's your thoughts on this particular number? Well, I think there's obviously an educational gap, as you point out, uh, in understanding religious freedom and understanding tolerance and promoting diversity in the face of, of deep conflicts. And we have a lot of history uh, to back that up on, even when our country has been engaged in huge debates about massively important issues that we've always found a way, either through court cases or administrative regulations or whatever the case may be, to accommodate people's religious beliefs and make sure that America remains a beacon of freedom. And I think if we can educate people on some of the history, uh, I mentioned uh, accommodating pacifists in the draft earlier, and there's a lot of other historical examples. People will realize, you know what, we don't have to have this egalitarian, one-size-fits-all rule for every single thing, uh, that we do believe in the dignity of every human being and the dignity and freedom of religious beliefs uh, and the pluralism and the tolerance that makes America a great place. Uh, and we can all, even though we don't get a, a, get a, a agree on every single thing, find a way to move forward together. Uh, I think that that will assuage a lot of the, the fears and even the fear-mongering uh, that I think a lot of people are promoting. So there's, a, there's an educational gap. You've hit the nail on the head, and we need to continue to talk about religious freedom, how it works, and why it's important for a free country like America. And the one thing we're forgetting is the number of folks, like we've said, who've been targeted, but we go to back to Firefox, who, who uh, was it a vice president or founder, resigned because it came out that he supported the Prop 8. We have uh, GoFundMe refusing to fund uh, the, the money being raised for one of the um, um, defendants who have been charged in one of these LGBTQ same-sex marriage issues. Ed, is it the Sweet Cakes? That they're refunding, they're refusing to allow funding through GoFundMe because they don't like the cause. How can that possibly be? And yet we're concerned about those with religious liberty who are the most loving and kind people when they do it appropriately, as the Bible says, we love our neighbor. And if they don't believe as we do, we shake the dust off our sandals and move on. (laughs) Well, there's been a lot of dust shaking going on this week. Um, But I, you mentioned the Mozilla uh, CEO. That was Brendan Ike at Mozilla, who was fired because he made a thousand dollar donation to the the Prop 8 campaign. And this just shows you the intolerance of those who are opposing laws like the RIFRA. Um, you know, a, a man who founded a company it was a, basically his own company, and then he's fired from it because he is exercising his free speech rights to donate money to a campaign or a cause that he believes in. And this is not the America that we all grew up in. Right. You know, this is these are not the values that our founders uh, were in favor of. Um, and it's just not it's not American to bully and harass and target people who don't share your viewpoint just because they have a different viewpoint than you do. Um, and and so this is a critical battle, I think, in the in the history of our country. I think we're at a crossroads where we're having to decide, you know, um, are we a country that is really founded on and based on freedom of speech and free exercise of religion, or are we a country that's going to move more towards um, countries like Russia, you know, where speech and religion have been have been uh, squelched and have been uh, burdened by government for year. And um, this is this is a, an identity crisis that we're having as a country. Absolutely. That we have got to answer it the right way. We are in dangerous territory. We have allowed the enemy on our mountain, and now we must regain and retake. It reminds me of the story of David and Goliath when I, I was in the Valley of Elah just this summer, and uh, one of the messages that one shared with us on that, Pastor Rob McCoy out of California, great message, and he just said, it's not so much that even the small guy beats up big big giant, it's that they allowed this giant in their camp at all to take over their land. Never should have happened. We shouldn't be having this debate in America. We should have stood firm all along, understanding what the First Amendment meant in full protection of religious freedom. And as you've heard from both uh, both Austin Nemix and and, um, Tammy Fitzgerald, this is not just about religious liberty, but will be about your your right to even give to donations to groups you believe in, to express yourself, to voice an opinion, 
Facebook, what is it? We, we know Matt Barber lost his job with an insurance company for writing on his own private time. We have a citizen who here in Iowa was an editor of a paper, wrote something in his private blog, lost his job. We have a Dalit Catholic school being threatened that they may not be able to use the other public school's football field anymore, any longer because they hold the stance on homosexuality as a Catholic school. These are issues that we have got to hammer out, and we cannot turn our backs on the 230-plus years of freedom and liberty as a country, the foundation of our Jewish Judeo-Christian values. And I wanted to get to the Supreme Court. We're just not going to get to today. Hopefully we can do that next week. I will tell you the Republican National Committee, if you go to Republican CSC, Republican CSC, Conservative Steering Committee, has a petition that you can sign in support of an amicus brief on the foundations of marriage being essential to a society. It's a great brief. You might just want to read through it just for good information. But uh, read that, sign it. They, you can still sign it even though the 28th is over. Sign it. And there's also, so far, a GoFundMe page that they have not shut down to help pay for those legal costs. Austin, closing words? Yeah, absolutely. If you want to understand the religious freedom debate in this country, understand what America is. America is a melting pot. It's a pluralistic society. We come from all different walks of life, and we find a way to work together, even though we don't always agree. RIFRA does nothing more than advance that very objective and ideal. It's about diversity. It's about tolerance. It's about pluralism. And anybody who opposes religious freedom laws doesn't believe in those core American values, and that's very sad. We need to stand up and believe in and speak publicly for our core American values, whether you're an individual, a ministry, or a Fortune 500 company. These are universal values that connect all of us, and it's what our country is all about. Excellent. Tammy, closing thoughts. Well, thank you, Tamara, for the opportunity to be on the show today. And um, I just want to say that it should be the, the purview of the people of any state in this country to exercise their religious beliefs as they go out into life every day in their work environment, in their homes, wherever they go. And um, if there are people who are upset with someone exercising their beliefs, the dictates of, of the commercial um, climate that we have ought to dictate where they do their business. Absolutely. I mean, if someone doesn't like what a business owner does, they, they're free to go somewhere else and give someone, some other business owner their money. So it should not be the government that should be forcing people to abide by certain viewpoints or, or certain speech in order to remain in business. Um, and so we, we um, are so thrilled to be partnering with Austin and the Alliance for Sending Freedom in our efforts here in North Carolina to further protect the religious freedoms of our citizens in our state. If you know of citizens in North Carolina, if you have friends, relatives there, give them a call. Let them know that this is on the docket. They'll be voting, I think, today. And uh, also send a note to help them send a note to the governor, encouraging him to stand strong. I do believe if Mike Pence would have stood strong, it would have been the fervor we saw beyond Scott Walker in 2012. I think it would have uh, foisted him onto the national scene as possibly a presidential candidate. And it's unfortunate that they did not hold tight to the meaning of that law in Indiana. And Tammy hit it correctly. The power of your dollar is your vote, and it's your vote right now. Don't hand it over to the government to dictate to you what you can and cannot believe. You've been given great information here. Tammy Fitzgerald has been my guest. Austin Nemix from Alliance Defending Freedom. Tammy's with uh, the North Carolina Values Coalition. More information, livefaithfullync.com, ncbizforrfra.com. Uh, I'll put things on the Truth For Our Time Facebook page. I'll put some links up a little bit later in the day after I get done at the State House myself. You've been given great information. Now be encouraged and never be complacent.